and I'll talk a little bit about how I got into this work uh, down the road. But uh, first, I wanted to uh, share that I have no conflicts of interest. I have uh, never been funded by industry. My funders for this work include uh, levels of government in, in Canada and um, hospital foundation. What, what I was hoping to cover today is talk a little bit about uh, what we saw in a large sample of uh, homeless people with mental illness in Canada, looking at uh, baseline neurocognitive functioning, looking at changes in uh, co cognitive functioning over time, and then looking at the impact of uh, neuropsychological impairment on the uh, functional outcomes over six years, which is a remarkably long time that we're very proud we were able to look at. And uh, now a little bit of how I got into this work. I li live in Toronto, and uh, Toronto is home to the largest cohort of homeless people in Canada with over 8,000 people that are homeless every night. Uh, across Canada, we have more than 30,000 uh, homeless people uh, in any given night. Uh, so we are a sizable number of them are in Toronto. Uh, most of you will be familiar with uh, what's next, which is that homeless individuals are at high risk of developing chronic medical conditions, um, have a higher mortality rate, premature mortality, compared to the general population, but they also have high rates of mental health problems, including addictions. Um, what is less spoken about is the degree of neurocognitive impairment about, um, among people that experience homelessness. My slides are very busy. I wanted to put as much information to make it easier to follow because I wouldn't know how the sound system would work or then translation would work. So my apologies for my busy slides. So what we knew in the literature when we started back in 2009, that we, um, small studies suggested that rates of neurocognitive impairment in this population um, were as high as 80%. And the etiology seemed to be multifactorial. Um, in, among the deficits most, most commonly noted were uh, verbal and visual memory, processing speed, attention, and executive function. At the time, research that looked at changes over time in, in this population um, were two or three, like very few studies looking at that. So we thought that was an opportunity for us to uh, get information on, on those outcomes. So when the opportunity arose and we launched the At Home Says What study, um, I, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Housing First. You had a similar study in, in France, um, but, but we thought uh, we'd include neurocognitive measures, uh, and we did. So who we served, first of all, a little bit about the study. It's the largest study of its kind in the world. We recruited uh, people across Canada that were adults, that were either literally homeless or precariously housed, uh, that had a mental illness with or without a substance use problem, and they were not at the time of recruitment served by a certain community treatment or intensive case management. We wanted to uh, reach out to those that had a real, a really no access to, to supports and services. Uh, we used a, a, a method I developed to uh, stratify people to high needs and modern needs uh, that worked quite well for us. Um, and based on um, diagnosis, history of hospitalizations, uh, incarcerations, uh, comorbid uh, concurrent substance use, and uh, the, we use the Multnoma Community Ability Scale to assess functioning. After we stratified, we randomized to receive housing first or treatment as usual. Housing First participants with high needs received uh, rent supplements and assertive community treatment. Uh, modern needs participants received uh, rent supplements and intensive case management. And treatment as usual participants in both arms received uh, the usual services that were available in the community. In, in some cases, they had access to assertive community treatment or intensive case management. 
um, in different cities, but uh, it was not consistent and it was scarce. So we managed to recruit uh, to over 2,200 people across Canada uh, in five cities. Um, and um, of those, we were able to collect uh, baseline neurocognitive measures um, on 1,500 participants. A couple of hundred participants more we were able to interview, but we um, felt that they were too intoxicated or otherwise unable to cooperate for, for an assessment. So of those 1,500, over 900 um, were agreeable to complete a follow-up interview at two years. So we had follow-up data on, on 922 participants. So I'll speak now what we did with this data. First of all, a few words about the measures we use based on our previous research um, with, with people with uh, schizophrenia. Um, so we looked, we use um, uh, trail making tests A and B to, to measure information processing speeds, psychomotor efficiency and cognitive flexibility. We also use the digit symbol uh, for that reason. And then we used um, the Hopkins verbal learning test for verbal learning and memory. And uh, we only had 20 minutes, so we wanted to um, to use uh, measures that were short that would give us the most information we could gather in a very short period of time. And to, to analyze, we used uh, for, for to, to assess, first of all, global impairment, um, we uh, developed uh, global deficit scores by methods uh, developed by Kerry. Um, so that is, we converted row scores to demographical corrected T-scores. And, and of note, we didn't necessarily have demographically corrected um, or norms for certain populations. So we did our best. Um, then the T-scores were converted into deficit scores that were averaged to create uh, the global deficit score. And we define overall neurocognitive impairment as a global deficit score of over half. And then to look at predictors of neuropsychological impairment and predictor of, predictors of changes in neuropsychological impairment over time, uh, we uh, converted the row scores into Z scores and created summary measures by averaging them. So a little bit about the population, so you have an idea of who were recruited to the study. Um, they were uh, young middle age, um, mostly male. Um, they, uh, the majority did not uh, finish high school. Um, the majority had English or first as their first language, but 18% uh, did not. It was a diverse sample. Aboriginal participants um, were purposefully overrepresented in our sample um, because some of our sites over recruited a certain demographic groups and uh, about half of our participants were uh, white. In terms of the clinical characteristics of our participants, uh, nearly half had psychosis, one of the primary psychotic illnesses, uh, a little over a half had a diagnosis of major depression and um, post-traumatic stress disorder was common as well as uh, alcohol and substance use disorders. Interestingly for us, uh, we also measured uh, the prevalence of traumatic brain injury and nearly half had a history of at least one severe traumatic brain injury. And just to give you an idea of the degree of marginalization of the, our population, um, more than half had been homeless for uh, more than three years. So I'll begin by uh, uh, a summary of what we found in terms of the level of neuropsychological impairment. Rates were high, 72% um, of our sample um, across moderate and severe uh, and high needs had neuropsychological impairment. The domains more affected was uh, verbal learning and recall. 
uh, where um, a sizable number of our participants had at least uh, moderate impairment. Now we wanted to identify some of the predictors of neuropsychological function. And, and there we used um, hierarchical multiple regression, entering uh, different predictors in uh, blocks, beginning with also sociodemographic variables, uh, then uh, clinical indicators, um, diagnostic and other variables, uh, then traumatic brain injury, and last but not least, duration of homelessness. Again, apologies for the uh, busy slide, lots of numbers. Um, but uh, what we found is that worse neuropsychological functioning was associated with, with older age, first language other than English or French, um, and then um, for, for Black and, and Aboriginal participants, we weren't sure we were using the right uh, norms, uh, so this may be overrepresented. Um, uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, history of psychosis um, was associated with uh, a worse neuropsychological functioning. What surprised us, because other research we had done in Toronto suggested that uh, TBI, traumatic brain injury, is an important contributing to, contributor to cognitive impairment. We found no association, at least with the measures, uh, the neuropsychological measures we used. We then went to look at changes over time and what happened over two years in Housing First and was housing, uh, whether in Housing First or housing stability overall in any way um, related uh, to, to changes to neuropsychological outcomes. There had been up to that point one study in, in Boston that suggested that people's neuropsychological functioning improves over time, but that it had not been replicated and it did not have a control group. So we use a very similar approaches to creating summary scores and global deficit scores. And, and this is what we found. First of all, regarding overall impairment. Again, these are the global uh, deficit scores. Although the, um, they may, the changes may seem statistically significant, overall changes across group um, were not statistically significant, although we did some small improvements in neuropsychological functioning over time. What was statistically significant were improvement in the proportion of those with severe impairment. So it, it looks like over time, those uh, the uh, percentage of severe impairment dropped for 54% to 49%, and that was statistically significant. We thought that was promising, and we thought that perhaps there would be an opportunity to examine it over longer time periods. And again, if we look at what predicted uh, improvements in your psychological impairment. Uh, this is for moderate needs participants, although when we publish, we combine our sample, we only publish on the overall sample. Um, we found that um, female gender, diagnosis of PTSD uh, were among um, predictors of improvements uh, and uh, age and first language uh, other than English uh, or French. Um, were predictors of decline. When it comes to high net participants, um, uh, similarly, uh, we saw that the diagnosis of bipolar disorders were related with improvements over time. In either moderate or high net group, we saw no impact of the housing on any of the neuropsychological outcomes. And uh, we had grouped the outcomes into two factor domains, uh, one, the verbal learning and memory domain, and the uh, complex processing speed and cognitive flexibility domain to facilitate uh, a smaller number of comparisons um, using principal factor analysis. So what did we learn from this work? Uh, we found that 72% of our sample experienced neurocognitive impairment. There was no association with traumatic brain injury. 
But the model, the predictive model we used, uh, explain only 20% of that variance. And in fact, the clinical factors explain only 3.5% of the variance. 16.5% of that variance were related to sociodemographic factors. So we started thinking what else we can do to understand um, the diversity of causes associated with neurocognitive impairment in this population. We also found um, that the rates of neuropsychological impairment remain high over time, um, and, and which raised the question of, of how do we address that and how we can incorporate um, specific interventions to improve neuropsychological functioning in this population. Our first question of what else, if, if only the model explains so only 20% of the variance in neuropsychological functioning, what else can be at bay? Um, we took notice that a large number of our participants uh, had a history of learning disabilities and school failure. We were aware of some literature suggesting that in, uh, the prevalence of intellectual disability is quite high in homeless populations. So we thought um, it would be an opportunity to take a look. So, uh, for example, in smaller studies that were not population-based, we had read that uh, the um, people with intellectual disabilities are overrepresented with uh, prevalence estimates uh, from 12 to 39 percent in small studies. We also knew from the literature, and there was very little literature at the time, that homeless people with intellectual disabilities may have more lasting chronic needs and they need uh, longer term supports and perhaps different kind of supports. My apologies for the sound. I work in a hospital and, and right now they're announcing a code white. For those of you that work in hospitals that you would know what that is. So I will pause until the announcement ends. Uh, apologies for, for the overhead announcements. Um, uh, hopefully there won't be any more um, for the remaining uh, time. So we had at that time uh, access to 172 homeless adults from the Toronto site um, because it was towards uh, the continuation of the study year three or four. And we were able to go back and uh, do uh, an uh, administer the new adult reading test revised, and based on these findings, classify those 172 participants into two groups, um, the borderline or lower intellectual functioning group and an above borderline intellectual functioning group. And what we found was 16% of our sample had borderline or lower intellectual functioning, um, which uh, was for us, uh, really key to figure out how we provide supports and services for this population. What we also find that at baseline, when we recruited these people, uh, those with borderline or lower intellectual functioning were on average, uh, were um, three years, uh, home, they were homeless three years longer than the group with above, above uh, borderline intellectual functioning. And this to me was, was remarkable and troubling because we are living a large number of quite disabled people uh, in shelters and on the street uh, with no appropriate services to support them exit. And then uh, we looked at um, what happened to them and whether Housing First worked for those with borderline or lower intellectual functioning. You know, we talk when we think about with about people with intellectual disability, we automatically think of the developmental disability sector um, that's different from the mental health sector. And um, we, we think that uh, the mental health sector wouldn't be able to support them. Yet, um, 
and again, the providers, our service providers, were had no awareness that these people were um, disabled intellectually. Um, but in terms of outcomes over time, people with borderline or low intellectual functioning in our Housing First Act and Housing First ICM teams did just as well as people with uh, bor above borderline intellectual functioning. So for us, this opened an avenue to explore uh, additional opportunities to serve this population that the developmental disability sectors uh, had not served well. Uh, these are people that have perhaps mild intellectual developmental disabilities. Some of them had moderate uh, intellectual disabilities, uh, but they also have uh, serious mental illness. They also often have substance use disorders and are excluded for housing models from uh, people with intellectual disabilities. So for us, the lessons learned from this piece of work, um, that piece of work actually was led by Anna Durbin, that is a junior scientist working in my team, um, was that given the high prevalence of intellectual and developmental disabilities in the population, um, we need to make sure we're screening for it, um, both in the um, homeless population, but also among those that have a history of, of school failure. Um, and also uh, opportunities to cross collaborate with the developmental disability sector to develop uh, models and either whether it's housing first adaptations or other models of care that can better support this population and maximize their independence. And such a model was launched actually in Toronto. I'm not going to talk about it today, um, but we did launch it and we, uh, in a pilot phase, we were able to successfully house 25 people with uh, moderate uh, intellectual disability, mild moderate intellectual disabilities over a year. Uh, and that was not a problem. And that was a collaboration between um, the city of Toronto, uh, a primary care team that specializes in homeless people um, and um, the developmental disability sector. Now we, because we were lucky enough in Toronto to get funding to continue data collection for up to six years, we thought it was an opportunity to uh, look at um, neuropsychological outcomes over longer periods of time. And not all of this data has been published. Some of it has, and some of it is um, in preparation. Um, but um, we thought it would be a unique opportunity. So some, some of it uh, will be news to you. So, uh, and the lead of all these wars was Christina, is Christina Gikas, who is another junior scientist, is a professor of psychology, a psychologist by training, um, that's at York University and had actually previous to this work had done work with homeless uh, people in um, Vancouver. So, and the question that we uh, thought we'd ask is, um, what is the impact of neuropsychological dysfunction that's enduring at least over the first two years on community functioning and quality of life? For this study, we had access to 349 homeless adults at the Toronto site. This is the number that we were able to follow for up to six years and who completed up to four cognitive evaluations. We used the similar methods we had used before in terms of summary scores and global deficit scores and uh, factor analysis. And we use li linear mixed models to examine cognition and functional outcomes and, and use uh, resilience as a moderator. And we looked at uh, uh, covariance over time. We look at how um, they did over time. So we found that uh, both learning and, and memory and processing speed and cognitive flexibility um, were associated uh, with uh, community functioning. Uh, that is be better learning uh, and memory, but better processing speed were associated with better community functioning. And that was not unexpected. Uh, we also, of course, uh, looked at other risk factors, uh, risk and protective factors. And when we looked at quality of life over six years, again, we found that cognition had no impact on quality of life. So which is one of the paradoxes that we've seen before where people with 
um, worse cognition often report better subjective quality of life. Um, resilience was protective for quality of life, but it did, it did not moderate the outcomes. So what did we learn from all this? Um, these neurocognitive deficits in this population among homeless people with mental illness and or addictions can result in difficulties in community integration, access to support services and housing stability. And with it, first of all, integrating cognitive screening as well as screening for intellectual functioning um, is key for us to make progress in that area. And, and the next step for us is can we integrate um, specific uh, interventions such as cognitive remediation uh, in housing complexes, in uh, teams, um, housing teams that uh, support this population, whether it's in shelters or on the street or in, in housing, uh, transitional housing. Uh, but definitely would love to see work uh, where cognition is a key intervention target is, and is better integrated into our um, uh, services. There are too many people to thank for this work. Um, the, uh, there were multiple investigators, uh, multiple study staff, and of course, uh, the big thank you goes to, went to our, to our funders that made it possible. And this is my last slide, and I'm uh, very happy to take questions if time allows. <laughs>